Good morning. Let's go ahead and stand and say a quick prayer before worship. Father God, we just thank you so much for this day and the gift of worship, and we just pray that you would help us put all our other worries aside and focus on you for this next few minutes. Amen.
All my intentions, all my obsessions, want to lay them all down in your hands. Only your love is vital, though I'm not entitled, still you call me your child. God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me, oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to take my hands off of my life and the way it should go. Oh, God, you don't need me, but somehow you want me, oh, how you love me. Somehow that frees me to open my hands up and give you control. I give you control is 
your phone still your love fought for me you have been so so Oh, 
Stick in an attitude of worship real quick, and we're going to do one last song. Yeah. Just, it's a little bit more upbeat, so, you know, I always encourage people to, um, you know, really get with the energy of the song, and if you don't know the words or whatever, just really think about what they, what they say as you see them up on the screen, and really take them to your heart. So, let's go ahead. child of wrath I walked condemned in darkness but your mercy brought new life and in your love and kindness raised me up with Christ and made me righteous you have brought me Satisfy my soul when I am heartless. If ever I forget my true identity, show me who I am. You have brought me back with the 
Amen. Go ahead and turn to somebody and say good morning. Good morning, South Point Church. If it's your first time here, we want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. We've been preparing all week and are so excited that we get to spend this Sunday morning together. If you need any information about who we are and what we do here at South Point, do us a favor. Drop by the Yes table after service. Our friendly volunteers would love to get to know you. As you find your seat, please take a look at what we've got planned for you in the coming weeks. School is starting again, which means it's time for South Point's Back to School Bash. Come join us Sunday, September 29th at the conclusion of the service as we serve food, have fun games for the kids, and give away backpacks and other school supplies to the growing students of Southeast Fresno. This is a perfect event to bless the students of our community with supplies to help them succeed in school, and we need your help to make this a reality. Volunteers are needed for the day of the event, as well as donations for the school supplies and the raffle. You can volunteer and donate by visiting the South Point website or by visiting the Yes table after service. Bienvenidos, hermanos y hermanas en Cristo. Estoy Pastor Claudia. Buenos días. I'll stop there. My Spanglish, I'll leave it to him. So um, we are going to do the memory verse at the stop, top of the verse. It, we are going to start with Romans, the verse, and then the passage. So let's go. Romans 15, 2. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Romans 15, 2. Great. Ish. That's how you survive in Mexico. She did it perfectly. So I got to beat that now. I don't know. Uh, I'll do it in English. Uh, good morning. Welcome to South Point. I'm, I'm Ish. And welcome, welcome to be here. <laughs> so it's uh, Romanos 15, 2. Cada uno de nosotros agrade a su prójimo en lo que es bueno, para edificación, Romanos 15, 2. Amen. Romanos 15, Morning, everybody. Welcome to South Point. I had a chance to hug a few of you. I'm so glad. Hopefully, we'll get to say hi before the day is over. Would you welcome those that are joining us on Facebook Live as well? We love you. We love you. We love you. Hey, wanted to let you know I got a call this morning, and one of our just just dear saints, uh, saints, Margaret Perez, um, passed away uh, yesterday. Yeah, and. Um, you know, we call that around here graduated. She got, to, she got to go. How many of you know it's a good thing to live your life for Jesus and then when your time, because death is inevitable for all of us, that when your time comes, 
Now, it isn't just death and the end. It's actually the beginning of seeing Jesus face to face for eternity. Amen? Yeah. And uh, there's some of our ladies there. And she, uh, Margaret had birthday last week. I understand a couple days ago she was dancing with uh, one of her friends. And uh, she uh, also had mentioned to one of our ladies that this would be her last birthday. And she wasn't messing around. She, did, she said it was her last one. She decided to go. And she's gone. Her uh, son is here today. Robert, would you stand? And I uh, just uh, heard you're here. Would you, would you please affirm him and tell him he's not alone, you guys? We love you. We love you. I'll tell you, she was a person who told me that she prayed for me every day, and I know she did. It's a great loss to this church. She prayed for you, too. She did, those of you that are warming your bottoms on the chairs right there. She would come and pray uh, in this sanctuary. And had she had gotten saved, uh, I think it's September 2000. Excuse me, uh, in September 1980, in this building, and she was part of the church merge as our churches came together, and always was really accepting of everybody. I love this lady. Get to see her in heaven. So what we're going to do in the next few days, you'll see some things posted online so that you know how we're going to celebrate her life. And we will do that. Let me pray real quick. Lord, we pray for family and friends, Margaret today, and especially the family that's here. We pray that they know they don't go it alone. We're in this together. And thank you for being her being a part of our church family, showing us how to be a Christian. She, she did that. And showing so many of us how to be a mom and a friend, an uh, incredible person. We pray as we celebrate her life, you would have your way and do things, even in her graduation, that she wasn't able to see this side of heaven. So we pray for that now. We thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, and everyone that agreed said, Amen. 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 Hey, two quick things. Number one, this is a big week for us. I'm going to call you to it. If you're not up to speed with what's going on, let me catch you up real quick. So uh, this is really kind of a local missions week for us. We've been asked by Channel 26 to host what is basically a town hall meeting for the city of Fresno this coming Tuesday. Everybody say Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Six o'clock, and we got a call from the station manager of, uh, of uh, KMPH TV and said, hey, please tell your people to come because we're trying to get some uh, influence and trying to fill up the seats for these town hall meetings. The, the issue that they're going to be talking about is the meth epidemic in Fresno, and I just want you to know we have the worst one in the nation. And so that's why we're addressing it. You can go to our website as of tomorrow, and I have a, about a 17-minute video that my son Colby sent me, a documentary about the meth epidemic in Fresno, and it is enlightening. It will help us understand how important it is that we do these things. So that's Tuesday night. If you want to help, I think the only thing we need now for help is some greeters to be here, help people who have never been to South Point before find their way into the building, you'd come at 5.30. Everybody else, would you say 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock. You didn't say it with force, man. 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock. All right. <laughs> 6 o'clock, Tuesday evening. Listen, if you got something going on, cancel it. Let's be together and support what our city's trying to do to be a better city. Amen? Amen. And thank God we can be a part of that. Secondarily, uh, not in terms of value, it's the same type of value, but also what we're doing this coming week or a week from today is our back to school bash. And so that's going to really entail some good news clubs and some mentoring programs that we do throughout the year, but also it's a day for us to celebrate the kids and the teachers. We have a couple special treats for you. Sunnyside Band's going to be here. we got some other stuff going on. And so it's going to be a great day. It is a day also for you to invite people. And I just want to make it easy for you as your pastor, learn how to incorporate people into your lives and to be a part of your Christianity. Uh, that day is a day where we're just going to, it's probably going to be 45 minutes in here, a quick, real quick, just message of love, letting people know who we are and what we're doing. We're going to give away backpacks. There's going to be, I understand they, someone got, I don't know who it was, it wasn't you, was it, that somebody made sure it's going to be a dunk tank, and they're going to put me in the dunk tank, and you guys can, not, what could be funner than dunking the pastor, I say, and so anyway, I'll try to raise some money for the play yard, we'll do some, it's going to be a great, we will eat lunch together, don't miss it, and again, if you have something going on, uh, cancel that, let's be together and make an effort to, to show the love of Jesus Christ in our neighborhood, in our beautiful valley. Uh, here at South Point. If you want to participate, uh, we also need donations financially. 
or if you're, this is kind of last call, if you've, uh, I know some of you have taken letters that are on the yes table to go to your places of employment and people that will sponsor us for the day, if you'd like to give. And I think we need about 15 more volunteers to make sure next Sunday goes well. You can do all of that at the yes table or as we give today after our wonderful message from our wonderful speaker. I don't know if you know the man to the right of me, and if you don't, you'll really enjoy him. Uh, this is just one of the most wonderful, dynamic. Talk about local and international missions that are on your heart and mind. If we were to cut you, you bleed mission, and that's just who you are. I love you so much, Freddie. Would you give it up for Freddie T, would you? Good morning, church. First off, before I get started here, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to you, Pastor. Uh, and, and thank you to the church for your support for our mission to the Congo. Um, you guys made it happen. Uh, you guys donated financially. You guys donated so many shoes uh, that we took to the Congo. Uh, we took it to an orphanage where we had about 400 kids that received some pair of shoes because of you, because of your love. So thank you. Thank you so much for what you have done because your love was sent all the way to the Congo and, and made an impact. That's the reason why I brought uh, the flag of the Congo, just a way to say thank you. Just a way to say thank you for the, the, the heart that you have for mission. Mission is in the heart of pastor. Mission is the heart of this church. Uh, back, back to school bash um, is our mission. Mission is what Jesus Christ has done for us. He literally left heaven to come down on earth. Didn't have to do it. Because think about it. He's God. He created the whole world with his word. So he could have saved us easily with his word. Nothing is impossible. He created it. He can save it. But he chose to move into our neighborhood. To come and become part of us. So that we can be saved. So that we can actually see the example of what it looks like to love God and to love your neighbor. Um, so uh, what I thought was interesting going back to the Congo was the fact that after 15, 16 years of being in America, I, I was no longer used to being in the Congo. It, 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 it seemed like it was a, a strange place to be. The dust everywhere. I visited my parents in my old neighborhood, um, and, and it just broke my heart to know that people live in this condition. But that's where I lived. That's where I grew up. I slept on the floor. Our home, which is still the way it is, not really the way it is, uh, a little improved, just a little bit, but still, if you look at it, you, you, you wouldn't even feel like spending the night there. You might not even sleep because you're not used to that. But that's what I grew up in. Me standing here is a miracle because I don't even know how I went from that. Those kids were barefooted, running in the in the street of Congo, to me here today. And if it's not God, who can that be? Who can I give credit to? Because I'm not the smartest, not the, 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 the greatest in any way, shape, or form. But somehow, he thought about me. It meant a lot to me. And I just want to go quickly through my message here uh, to share with you my, 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 my journey the years that I spent here and how it transformed me to the person that I am. I left a different person and I went back to visit a different person. And God allowed me to go through this journey. But I want to start with the first question, is God real? Now, I never had to ask myself that question because I grew up in a Christian family. If you didn't believe in Jesus, they're going to whoop you until you believe in it. That's just how my dad believed. We had to go to church because it was an obligation. If you don't go to church, you don't eat because you don't want to be fed spiritually, and then you don't need to eat food. So we had to go to church. It wasn't a question. It was an obligation. We woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning to pray. You had no excuses. Everybody had to pray. And so I've never asked that question, is God real? For me, God was real. Otherwise, I get whooped. This is it. But on the other side, there is people that didn't grow up like me in the Christian home. There is people that even 
grew up in a Christian home but just went through some difficulty in life and started questioning, is God real? Now, I can't respond to that question. But I just want you to think with me. Everything that we know in life, everything that we know in this world has three things in common. It has an inventor. It has a beginning. And it has an end. Which means if you have a cell phone, if you ever bought a cell phone, a couple years after, it's no longer good. It's the end. And it had a beginning because somebody created it and sold it to you. And then you use it. Which means there is an inventor behind it. Everything we know, you can't tell me there is an exception. If you think about the world, there is no exception. It had a beginning. You may have missed it because you were not there. And it's going to have an end. No questions asked. Because everything follows that logic. And that also means that it has an inventor. Somebody who is bigger than the universe who was able to start it. Now, Smart people wanted to convince us that somehow the Big Bang Theory started this whole thing. But it's hard for me to believe that a Big Bang would be so organized. If you don't know anything about the sun, the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. It's about 300,000 in mass bigger than the earth. The, the energy that we receive in, on earth comes from the sun. In that distance, the light that goes from the sun in this 93 million take about eight minutes to get to us. That's how powerful the sun is. It's a, it's a ball of fire, gas, burning in the nuclear reaction. If that sun was to get any closer to the earth, we're dead. Everything would be gone. If that sun was to get any farther from the earth, we frozen. So life on earth depend on the sun and this distance and how everything works together. Can you imagine the bank realizing this kind of balance? If you don't believe me, put a glass, a piece of glass in there. Put every single piece of, 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 of component that you think your cell phone will need. Put it in a bag and shake it really hard, really hard, and then open and see if it's going to be an iPhone. If it turns into an iPhone, then the Big Bang Theory is great. But if it doesn't, then that means there is no way that a bank will realize something so organized. It's got to be a God who is bigger than us, who is capable of organizing every single little thing so that it will work in the way that it works. I honestly believe that it takes more faith to believe that there is no God than it takes to believe that there is a God. Because if there is no God, then you have to explain me how the Big Bang really happened. You have to explain me what is the first cell. Who started the first cell? There is a, the law of uh, thermodynamics that says nothing, energy is not created nor destroyed, but it goes from one form to another. So there can't be energy just being created for no reason. For that Big Bang to happen, it's a whole lot of energy. Out of nothing. It's impossible. But when I hear the word of God, the very first line of Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe in that. It's easy for me. I don't have to think too hard. It doesn't require much faith to believe that there is a God, yet we are still trying to figure out so much more. When you read the book of Job, Job was this righteous man. I don't think there is any righteous man in this world like Job today. Because if God and he's sitting with this meeting of those heavenly people and our heavenly creature, however, angel. And they say, man, this Job is righteous. God himself recognizing you're right. Job is not righteous. That's real righteous right there. It doesn't get any better than that. But yet Satan was like, man, you know what? The only reason why he's that good is because you blessed him with so much. And so God said to Satan, Go ahead and take everything, but do not touch his life. And so Satan took everything. And Job, at the beginning, was all faithful and said, God, you know what you're doing. I trust you. And then things started getting hard, and he just lost it. It was like, I, I, I cursed the day that I was born. What's going on here? This, God, you need to come here and explain yourself to me. And this is God coming to him to explain himself. Job 38, 5 to, 3 to 5, it says, now brace yourself. This is God speaking. Brace yourself like a man 
and I will question you, and you will inform me. God saying, you will inform me. So he asked, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have any understanding, who fixed its measurement? Surely you know. You should be able to tell me. Or who stretched the measuring line across it? Job is now being asked these questions that we always ask ourselves. Is it really God? But God is saying, I was there. What were you when I built this thing? You trying to explain it? Go ahead and explain it. I did this. And when I did it, you were not there. So I get to decide what I do with you because I created you. But we always question. I honestly question God. And that's what led me here. When I came to America, just like I described to you, I came from a country that is really poor. We didn't really have much. And so I came here, and I saw blessing all over the place. I saw things that I've never seen, and I started questioning God. I said, is really God just? Is God real? Is God loving to everyone? Or does he just select a group of people to bless? Because somehow, this, this did not happen for me. I remember calling my mom to say, hey, mom, I just want to let you know I will build you a mansion. Somehow in my heart, I was telling mom, I will fix what God got wrong. I saw you guys serving, giving everything you had, everything you had. Every, and they, they didn't even have much, but yet they lived a life serving everybody else. And I said, you know, I will fix this man. I will build you a mansion. In this country, you can go to school full-time, work full-time. I will take the advantage of what is offered here to fix the problem. My mom laughed, and she said, Freddie, are you okay? <laughs> you talking about school and work. I don't know you loving school or work. So I don't even know how you're going to build me this, this, this mansion that you are talking about. And then she went ahead and said, listen, we served our purpose. We did what we were supposed to do. We blessed you with what God has given us, and we showed you the example of serving other people. And my mom said, go ahead and find a problem there and solve it. God blessed you to be there, and he created you so that you can solve a problem. Identify the problem and take care of that. Don't worry about it. I said, today I was to die, I'll, I'll be happy. And that was hard for me to, to, to say that because we, we, we're scared of death. We, we hate death. But a person who's willing to die is only a person that understood their purpose and lived their purpose, and they can say, God, I ran my race. I've done my job. I'm ready to go. I don't need to stay here if you don't want me here. Can you actually honestly say that are you ready to go, that you lived your purpose? What is your purpose? Do you even understand why God got you here? That got me. But I was still challenged. Because I didn't believe that I was blessed until I worked at the jail, dealing with inmates. And, and these guys shared their stories. And, 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 and when I thought that, man, I should have been born in America, I found these young people, they were born in America, that ended up in jail. And they explained to me that they didn't have a father. They didn't have uh, role models in their life. And at that moment, I, it, it, just, it just dawned on me that even though I was in this broken country in the middle of nowhere with no hope whatsoever, I still had people that love me, care about me, set me on this path, teach me about God, teach me to work hard, teach me to pursue to be a blessing to someone. Yet these kids here, unfortunately, did not have that. So now I was no longer cursed, obviously, because that's what I thought. And I thank God that did, he didn't listen to my prayer. Be careful what you're praying for. Because when I pray, I pray for God to allow me to be born in America. I could have ended up in jail because I never asked for parents. Sometimes God doesn't give you what you're asking for because you might end up in jail. You might end up in prison. You might end up dead. So you're not ready for this. I know where you are right now. And so at that point, I realized I was blessed. I was blessed beyond description to be in this position. I don't know if you realize how blessed you are. God was speaking to Joshua. And he was speaking to the, 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 the people of Israel. Uh, and, and this is what he said in Joshua 24, 13. He says, so I gave you a land on which you did not toil, which means work, to produce. And cities that you did not build. And you live in them and eat from the vineyard and the olive grove that you did not plant. God was telling them, listen, I have to kick out 
all those Canaanites and the Ammonites and the Philistine. I, I, I have to get rid of all these people. And I brought you into a land that you did not build at all. Would you tell me that you built America? What did you do to build America? Nothing. Somehow you just showed up in the hospital and you are an American. Right? At least I had to take a plane to come over here. Y'all just showed up. But think about it. This is how much God has blessed you. It's not just my story because I came from the Congo. You did not check and say, I want this kind of family. You did not check and say, I want this kind of country. You did not apply for anything. It's somehow God shows that it was the right thing to bless you to be who you are. When we watch the movies or, or do we watch the, the things that are happening in other countries, we feel, oh my God, these people, they'll never change. As if really you are different. But guess what? It was God that chose for you to be here. And the Bible continues to say that God is not unjust. That God is just. Romans 2, 11 said, God does not show favoritism. Peter, when he went to Cornelius' house uh, and, and, and he was praying, Cornelius was a Gentile and Peter was a Jew. And as he was sharing about God, the Spirit came down on the Gentile. And he was like, now I know that God does not show favoritism because he came down even on the Gentile. So if God does not show favoritism, the question is, why did he decide to bless you and I? Why did he decide to give you and I a different situation. It's a question that we have to ask ourselves. What is God's plan for your life? What is God's plan for my life? Jeremiah 1.5. God's speaking to Jeremiah. And God says, before I formed you in the womb of your mother, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you a prophet to nations, I appointed you. So God knew you way before you even come to this country. Way, because you are a spiritual being. You are an eternal being that God decided to put in a body, and that body has a soul. So somehow God thought, man, I, I, I want him to be here, and I want him to be able to do X, Y, and Z. It was God's decision. God knew Jeremiah way before he was born. He appointed him to be a prophet. So somehow God has already appointed you to the work that you're supposed to do. Say, I know exactly why I created you for. This whole world is so confused because we are trying to figure out who we are outside of your inventor. But no, you can't figure out who you are outside of your inventor, your creator. Because when your creator created a cell phone, he's expecting you not to mop the floor with the cell phone. He already has an intention for that cell phone to be used as a phone. Which means God has a plan for you. You can't find it outside of God. you got to find it in God. The world is confused and somehow we have a truth that will set them free to let them know who they are exactly because it's only God that can give that information to you. God has created us. Human beings are the pinnacle, the, the, the most important creation that God made. There was a man who wanted to be the most powerful creation on earth and so he spoke to God and said, God, I, I want to be the most powerful creation on earth and God said, I already created you the most powerful creation on earth. And they say, no, look at the water, man. During uh, the, the, the arrogant season, it takes out everything. I want you to make me as powerful as the water. So God said, okay, now from now on, you are the water. So he became the ocean, and he was just enjoying breaking everything around the world until one day uh, after, area, after the arrogant comes the sun. The sun dries the water, and now he realized, man, the sun is powerful. More powerful than water. Say, God, why don't you make me the sun? So the sun is just doing what the sun does. I say, okay, make me the sun. So he became the sun, and he enjoyed drying water. He enjoyed burning everybody. But when he was drying water, water turned into vapor, vapor turned into cloud, and the cloud started stopping. The sun is like, now the, the cloud is covering me. I want to be the cloud, because obviously the cloud is more powerful. 
So God say, okay, great. You want to be the cloud? Cloud is doing what the cloud does. So you want to be the cloud? You become the cloud. He becomes the cloud, and he was covering the sun, and he enjoyed covering the sun until the wind came and blew the cloud, and now he was all over the place. He's like, man, the wind is more powerful. I want to be the wind. He's like, okay, you want to be the wind? I'll turn you into a wind. So he became the wind, blowing everything, and he enjoyed it. Then he saw a mountain, and he tried to blow the mountain. The mountain would move and say, man, I want to be the mountain. The mountain is not scared of the, 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 the wind at all. And God said, you want to be the mountain? Great. You are the mountain. So he became a mountain. He enjoyed standing right there until the village people said, hey, man, we want a road here. So they blew up the mountain, and they created a road. And so he, hey, man, who did this? I say, it's the man. I said, oh, then I want to be a man. You were a man. Sometimes we don't realize that God has already blessed you, and you're still looking for something else. We are this creation that God has blessed. And the reason why we are blessed, when you read Genesis, uh, first chapter, in the 20, uh, verse 27, God created mankind in his own image. In his image, God created them. Male and female, he created them. God did not give his image to anyone else but man, but you and I. What that means is that we have to reflect God's character. We have to reflect God's ability to create. We have to reflect God's ability to show sense of justice, to intercede for people, to rescue, to show mercy, to forgive. This is quality that God has. God wanted us from the beginning to be able to create something. When God created Adam, the first thing he asked Adam, name all these animals. Start creating. Come up with names. Innovation. We are those creations that God set high up there for a reason. Genesis, first chapter, verse 27. God blessed them. This is God speaking. Bless them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase or multiply. Multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. God is telling the mankind that I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Now, I know we only took it in the context of making babies, so we ran and started making babies, and now we have 8 billion people on earth. But it wasn't just about that. It was about the seed that he has put in you to be able to be fruitful, produce something. And when you produce that, multiply it and fill the earth with that and subdue it. Use what I created for you to do something with it. That's what God had in plan for us. Even when we sin in Genesis 3 where sin came into the world, he sep- we got separated from God. God still wanted that plan to go forward. And so he reached out to a man called Abraham in chapter 12, Genesis chapter 12. And he promised this man, he said, listen, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And I will, I will, I will, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. And he continued to say, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And through your offspring, through your family, the whole world will be blessed. So what God really wants from you is that he wants to rescue the world through you. He wants to save the world through you. He wants to bless you and bless the world. But he needs you to step up and actually take this job seriously. Jesus did the very same thing. Jesus had to bear fruit. The fruit that he brought was fruit of salvation. So he was fruitful. And he multiplied the fruit. How did he multiply the fruit? He called 12 people. He trained them so that when he dies on the cross, that these people will go ahead and basically replenish, multiply, reach out to even more people all the way to the end of the earth. He did exactly the same thing, being fruitful. There is something in you that God has put inside of you that would change humanity. And humanity is waiting on you to express yourself, reveal yourself with what God has put in you. Don't look at yourself as if you have nothing to offer. Don't look at yourself as if there is nothing that you can do. There is something amazing about you. Sometimes we just look at all the people and we think, man, they're great. I, I wish I was able to be like them. No, God created you different. And there is something about you that would change the world. And you've got to connect with God, work hard, multiply what God has given you, and reach the world with it. Because God wants to change this world because of you. 
through you. This is what we are called for. When I do what I do in the mentoring or trying to build this hospital, when my parents' house is not even that big, because she told me, my mom, she said, that's fine. Don't worry about that. Just serve God. We spend about a hundred and something thousand so far in this building, yet my parents still live in this broken place. What I've learned from my parents is that God has blessed you with so much, and you got to use that leverage to actually impact the world if it's, Ill, if it's legal, if it's not illegal, if it's not unethical, if it's not irresponsible, God wants you to use it. Sometimes we start making decisions based on where we are now. See, when you were broke, you couldn't go to vacation, so you showed up and served at the church and everywhere else. And now that you got a car, you got vacations. And then, hey, we got to go serve some homeless. Over here. Oh, yeah, we, my family and I, uh, we planned the vacation. When you are broke, you showed up. Right? So somehow we make decisions based on where we are today and we forget where we come from. That's what keeps me grounded. God says, do not forget your first love. That's what keeps me grounded. I look back to where I came from and I'm standing here with the suit. I never thought that I would ever wear a suit like this. I'm just telling you that I know that if it's not God, I wouldn't be here. And so therefore, why should I just... Take care of only my kids. Take care of only my things when everything that I have comes from God. That's what we need to remember. John 20, 21, Jesus is telling the disciples, has the Father sent me, so I am sending you. The Father sent me to be fruitful, to multiply. Now I'm sending you to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, replenish the earth. That's what we are called for. Be fruitful. And multiply. Express yourself. Bring that out. Save lives. Point them to God. Because you have, listen, I'm going to tell you this. Sometimes we think that uh, the problem is resources. The problem is not resources. God has every resources in the world to take care of everything else and everybody else. The problem is mentality. We don't understand that we have to innovate, create. God did not give a chair to a man. God made a chair and hid it in a tree. And so the man had to go to the tree and cut it down and create a chair. God did not give an airplane, a car to a person, but he gave him the ability to create, to show his character. There is nothing new under the sun. So basically Moses could have fly a plane. Moses could have drive a car because the same thing that that makes the car today, metal, uh, petroleum product, whatever, it was already there. So it's the man who has the responsibility to create, to reach, to bless, to rescue. God wants to do it through us. But I understand, though, building the next generation is our job. And I understand that sometimes it's difficult because that's what Jesus did. He reached out to a group of people, the disciples, and he built a new generation here, released them. When he went to heaven, somebody was there to talk about Christ. If he did not have those people, God would have died on the cross and nobody would have been there to talk about it. God created you and I for that purpose, just like the disciples. But we are going through hard time. I get it. We are going through storm. I get it. We are going through difficulties. I get it. But do you understand that God is allowing those difficulties to mold you to the person that you ought to be? There is five things that I want you to remember when you are going through hard time. The first thing that I want you to remember is that you've been blessed by God beyond description. I know we always focus on the part that we don't have. Look at everything that you have. Look at your life comparing to a kid in the Congo today. Some of those kids that we give your used shoes and they were jumping with joy. And yet you're saying, hey, I don't have it, God. God blessed you because of that. Proverbs 39, uh, 30, verse 9 says, otherwise I may have too much and disown you and ask, who is the Lord? I get it. You may say, no, I've never asked this question. The Lord is Lord. The word Lord literally means the honored. 
That's why we call the landlord, landlord. He owns the land. You don't change anything in that land unless you reach out to the landlord and say, hey, can I do this? Your body belongs to God. Everything you got belongs to God. When you say, God, uh, I got to, you know, take care of these things here and my kids uh, because I'm a little busy. You are denying the Lord being the Lord because the Lord asked you to serve here. But because he blessed you, you say, man, you blessed me so much I don't have time. It's like a parent who gave everything to a son, and her son is now running all this business, and the parent called, hey, I'm sick at the hospital. Can you come and see me? He's like, Dad, I'm, I'm a little busy. I'm taking care of the business here. I gave you that business, and now I'm sick. You're going to tell me you're taking care of your business? It's my business. So remember that God has blessed you beyond description. Number two, believe that you are built for the storm. He never gives you more than you can handle because he's with you, helping you to find you a way out so that you can endure it. So he's preparing you for that storm. Whatever you're going through, I guarantee you, I promise you that you have what it takes to actually make it. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't feel like you can't make it because God has given you that already. You have it in you. God is with you. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But I know we always think that I can do. No, it's Christ that strengthens you. So Christ really can do anything, right? Nothing impossible. So you're not the one doing it. It's Christ doing it in you because he is with you. Because he strengthens you to be able to face whatever you're going through. Remember that it's just a season, that there is always a season. The good thing about a season, it's just a season. Summer, spring, it just changes. Winter, it's going to stop. It's not forever. Don't make a permanent decision to a temporary situation. Don't decide to kill yourself. That's a permanent decision. When it's just a temporary situation. Don't decide to, to, to... to get rid of everybody, to, to hurt other people, to make hard decisions, to divorce, because it's just a season. If you are broke today, it's just a season. If you don't have a job today, it's just a season. If you don't have what you want, you don't, you're not married, it's just a season. Even if people call you ugly, it's just a season. Because when you get money, you look good. It doesn't matter what people say, like, I got money, oh yeah, you look good, that's it. It's just a season. And season comes and season goes. The other thing is remember that God allows this for you to be able to, to be able to change elevation, to be able to grow. You go, you grow through whatever you go through. And so God wants you to grow, reach a different elevation. The eagle has wings that are like seven feet. The eagle looks for storms. Because he uses the storms to actually go higher and higher. The eagle is not a chicken. Chicken can't fly that high. And they run from storms. So I don't know what you are. Eagle or chicken, you choose. But God created the eagle to look for the storm and to glide up and stay high up there. And just actually the the eagle rests on those storms because he got it like that. To be above the storm. Don't give up. Think about it as the the, the ego. Suffering brings perseverance, perseverance character. Character brings hope, and hope will never disappoint you. My last point, I trust that God has allowed you to go through this because he's got a plan for you, a plan to prosper you, not to harm you and give you hope and a future. He's got a plan for you. This is true. Do you know that over 80 million, no, over 80,000 people die in their sleep? Daily. It's not they were sick. They just, they woke up dead. I don't know if you can say that. It just sounded good. They woke up dead. But somehow God spared you. You are here. And you can't even say amen. Let me hear you say amen. Amen. Exactly. God has blessed you. He's still giving you another day. Not because you are so good. Not because you never sinned. Not because you've never done anything wrong. It's because he's got a plan for you. Plan to prosper you so that you can be able to help others prosper. So back to school bash is our opportunity for mission. This is where we get to show what God has given us. So let's take the time to reach somebody. 
Because mission is not about a place. It's not about a location. It's about people. Where people are, you can actually go to mission. This is it. Let's reach people for God. Let's change people. Let's create in their life. Let's rescue them. Let's set them in the course that God wants them to be in so that they can glorify the Father. This is our job. This is our responsibility. This is what God is allowing us to do. It's a privilege. God can do anything without you. He doesn't need you. That's one thing that I, remember, I, I realized. That's the reason why I, I don't feel so bad when I get a no, because I know that somehow God will make a way out of no way because he already has a plan. And he can use you or not you. It doesn't matter. He's still going to make it happen because he's God. He's powerful. So leverage everything you got. If it's not illegal, if it's not unethical, if it's not irresponsible, leverage everything you got for God by impacting the next generation. The next generation is not just the younger people because not all the disciples were younger than Jesus. The next generation is someone who can take you, take from where you left to the next place. If you teach them the gospel, if you empower them, if you give them what they need, they'll take it from there and reach someone else where you can't reach. That's our next generation. So invite someone. When you come to church, even on Sunday, invite someone in your home. Invite someone. Bring someone along. Look at all those chairs. We can fill it up. How many people do you know? And how many people don't show up to church? What can't you tell them? Hey, man, let's go hang out. Let's have coffee, and then we'll go to church. Or if not, come home. Let's, let's share this food. Let me tell you about this Jesus that saved my life. Everything I got is God and not me. You point them to God, they'll show up because they'll want to have what you have. I will stop right there. Um, too many ideas in my head. <laughs> Somebody's speaking to me. I don't know who that is. But I'll stop right there, and I just want to take the time to pray with you. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? The main thing is really to know Jesus. Because when you know Jesus, and then Jesus can do extraordinary things in your life. So if you have not accepted Christ in your life, I just want to pray with you right now. And say this prayer with me. Say, Father, I am a sinner. I need you to come into my life. Forgive me. Reveal yourself to me. And show me who you are. And show me who I am so I can serve you. I want to believe in you. I want to believe and the fact that you were raised from the dead. I want to call you and declare that you are my Lord, my Savior. Come and save me, God. If there is anyone that prayed this prayer with me, with your head bowed, would you just raise your, your hand so I can see you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God, you heard the prayer of our brothers and sisters. They realize that you are God and there is no other God but you. We pray that you take them to the next level. Allow them to be able to use their talent so that they can impact someone's life. Thank you, Jesus. So that they can be able to serve this community. So that they can be able to bring light. For all of us, we pray, God, that would you use us today? As we know you, would you reveal more about you and us so that we can serve you in everything? Use this opportunity that we're going to have next Sunday to reach even more people for you. Yes. And glorify you. And exalt you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you help me thank Freddie? Love you, man. It's so good. We have an incredible opportunity this week. We really do. Um, he did such a good job. I want to say a bunch of things too. My mind's going crazy. I'm not going to. I would like to say, though, that we, how many of you, so if you look around the room, would you look around the room for a moment? Matter of fact, prepare, before you do that, prepare your tithes and offerings, if you would. If you'd like to give to the Back to School Bash, we're trying to raise about $6,000, and if you want to give toward that, please make sure your tithes come first and then offerings next. Uh, this opportunity that we have next week will be stellar, and so if you want to give toward it, you can do that. Or there's a kiosk over here you can give with today. Servers, would you come? If you're visiting today, or if you responded, I saw about eight hands go up when Freddie...
prayed, and I think I'd sure like to light the cross. This is for you, the, those that came to Christ today. Let's go ahead and light the cross and thank the Lord for that today. And if you did respond, would you just fill out that white card? Let us know who you are. There's also some material, some Bibles, some other stuff that we want to give you today if that's the case. If you would please look around the room uh, today, you'll see flags. These are the countries that we have visited so far for short-term missions, well, I think all of them. There's also long-term missions there uh, as well, Cambodia. And, um, and um, uh, we're going to, how many of you think it would be a great idea? Thank you so much for the flag, Freddie. We're going to hang this flag up. What do you say? We'll do that on the walls, yeah? And uh, we'll add that to what the Lord has done in and through us as a congregation. Um, so honored in that way. I want to remind you that this coming, again, Tuesday evening, if you want to come and help get people into the facility, it'd be 5.30. And then 6 o'clock, pastor is asking for us to show up strong so that we can be together and help represent our community in such an important thing. The tele telecast that KMPH will be doing is a live broadcast and a town hall meeting. And so that's really special that we're able to do that. And uh, Candice uh, Funk is one of the... Uh, Emmy-winning producers there on, in the morning show, part of our congregation. She's going to be running it here on Tuesday, so we have that, and that's a real blessing. Then, of course, heading toward next week. Next Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning underneath the canopy, we will be handing out, uh, if you would consider coming, we're going to be distributing flyers in the community so people know that the event's taking place. So that's next Saturday. And then next Sunday, we'll be together for the bash, and we'll bash it up a little bit for Jesus. Stand to your feet, would you please? Let me pl pray for you. I'll send you on your way. Heavenly Father, thank you. Matter of fact, grab the hand of someone next to you, would you please? Let's say this together. Um, and I, by the way, I, what Freddie said just strikes me so near and dear, especially with Margaret not being here with us today. Uh, you, you know, loved ones, you, because you have breath, you still have a chance. It's not over, man. You still have a chance. Leverage what you have for him. You'll be so glad you did. Say this aloud and together with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me a chance. Thank you for giving me many chances. Would you allow me the privilege of serving you? Because in serving you, there is life and life everlasting. Help me to get my eyes off of myself only and help my fellow man to your glory. Bring people together to this campus next week to celebrate you and them. Thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic day.